right. It'll be all right. Um, this presentation talks a little bit about some challenges I'm seeing. I'm with Ohio State University's Wexner Medical Center. I'm the CISO. It talks a little bit about the challenges I've seen with going from decisions being made to actual implementation of controls that we would expect to be in place. It is not the answer to it, but hopefully it will spark some discussion and if there are some topics that maybe are timely for you folks, we can discuss it as a group and maybe offer some advice on how, how to move it forward. Uh, so real quick, who, let me get a percentage of kind of like management versus uh, engineers and implementers. How many folks are in a management or senior management role? A quarter, if that. Okay, so I'll try to shift back and forth a little bit between where management may fit versus those that implement. So I'll start talking about a uh, governance structure that NIST recommends, not necessarily the governance structure in your environment or the one that we follow. Um, some of the obstacles with that top-down approach from a decision-making perspective to the actual implementation, and there's some tactics that you can try. Again, not a recipe, but ways to think about it as you move from decisions to implementation. And it's interactive, stop me at any moment, you don't have to wait until the question section. So in most of our, most of our roles here, we're looking at measuring risk and then implementing controls to manage the risk. It's going from, you know, we sit there and see a gap in our environment or a gap in our tool set, and we want folks in either our server environments to put a technology in place, our leaders to recommend a policy or adding locks to doors or environmental controls and data centers. So we find the risk and we would hope that through a management process we can get to a place where controls are actually implemented and the right controls. But it's not always easy to go that route. What the senior leaders want versus what we actually tell the implementers just doesn't always align. A typical governance structure has a executive Pass it to it at the top, whether it's a steering committee, a board, something of that nature. You have functional managers, kind of middle management, or they may be senior management, but they control the resources that actually do the work. Then you've got folks that actually do the work. Typically, it works sort of top down. Go and get a decision, go and get a resource, and make somebody do something. But there's so many breakdowns in between. So the risk comes in here. You would hope to have your senior leadership or your, your steering committees or your project management risk decision makers, make a decision about how to treat the risk, take that to a manager, get the staff to do it, get the money to do it, and actually make it happen. And sometimes the money happens here as well. But I'll, I'll talk a little, about, a little bit more about that in uh, future slides. But that's fairly typical. But inside the minds of those leaders, from what they either hear, or what they fear, or what we've told them, as we go through looking at security controls, doesn't always work with the people implementing. I don't know if you can read that, but it says, I may look calm, but in my mind, I've already killed you three times. There's been many engineers that you go, you go to, and they're sitting there and having a conversation with you, but it's like, just go away, I'm busy. So what are some of the barriers that prevent, prevent us from going from that decision to actual implementation? A lot of times it's unrealistic expectations. You go to a board or senior leadership, and they'll say, stop it all. I want all the bad stuff to stop. It's not realistic. We can't prevent everything. But depending on how you deliver that message, depending on what they've heard, Sorry, can folks hear me? Oh, I'm sure she got the titles in. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 Can folks hear okay in the back? Yeah. Okay. So unrealistic expectations. Can you turn the oh. microphone up a little? Is the microphone on? Yeah, I think they said they're, they're fine back there, right? Okay. I'm good. <laughs> so you know, unrealistic expectations, either from, and at all levels, right? That some of the engineers may feel it's unrealistic for me to support an environment that has no boundaries. Like I have users that can do everything and leadership won't make a change from a policy perspective so this is, it's not practical for me to do all this stuff. Or if it's wipe out every potential risk, again it's unrealistic. Decentralized IT, so you may get a good decision depending on how your organization is structured, but you go to a person that's not in your functional line of control and they have a different uh, priorities, which is what I'll ultimately get to. So, in architectural limitations, things in the cloud are easier, things on premise are a little bit more difficult, sounds simple, but just you can't do it because of the way you're architected. But the key being to me, priorities. So based on who you're talking to, they have a different set of priorities at that moment when you're speaking to them. This is a, um, I think it's Gartner that actually created this one, it may not be Gartner. But 
usually in your executive and your middle management areas, they're usually looking at transforming or growing the business. That's the way they think about the business. And then the folks that, that implement the operators, they're thinking about running the business. They get the phone calls about the break fix, they get the phone calls about upgrading applications, the phone calls about you know, do your timesheets, do your status reports, you know, just the everyday stuff they have to do. And you've got the grow section where these managers, they're busy, right? Do, do more with less. Your budget's been slashed. Improve that process. I don't like this metric. You know, the customer satisfaction isn't there. And at, up top is we may buy a new organization and I expect them to function just like my current organization does, but we, we don't even know each other, right? You just purchased them yesterday and why do they look so different from us? Again, an unrealistic expectation. So, you know, what can you do? It's, again, there's no easy silver bullet to knock down all these challenges. But there are ways you can get a little more creative in how you think on, on who you're talking to to maybe get exactly what it is that you want to happen at that level. And an example I'm going to use is um, I want a sandbox deployed. No, I'm serious. I want a sandbox deployed. So I haven't got it yet. So hopefully you guys can talk to me if you have one deployed and tell me how to get one deployed. But it's you've got to start off with you know what do you want to happen at that level where you're having that conversation? What do you actually want to happen? The senior leaders do not turn on sandboxes. They can allocate funds, but they don't actually push the button to turn it on. Middle managers, same thing. They don't turn it on. And they may not understand what it takes to turn it on, but they've given you a resource who's already very saturated from a you know, demand perspective, and you're asking them to do more. But they've given you that resource. And by the time you get to that person that's really busy, thinking back to that you know, earlier captioned slide, they may look calm, but they're very upset that you're bringing them more work. So how do you get the sandbox? Thinking back through this pyramid, if you think about the people that want to transform the business, what you really want from them is a decision. But if you talk to them in a way that they're thinking, they're transformative people, they're thinking innovatively, use those terms to kind of get through that wall they've already created. With the, in the growth section, again, the process improvement managers, etc., you want their resources. How do you get their resources? And it can't necessarily be just a mandate. It's got to be something that appeals to them to allocate those resources. And then in the, the run department, you want them to execute. Ultimately, you want them to just do the work you're asking them to do. You're not going to get it through being um, overly demanding task manager because you're not their manager. You're, you're asking for this resource. It's not in your line of command. So thinking through that governance structure to go from that decision all the way down to implementation, it's not usually best to think about it top down. It's pretty linear in each place, and it goes back and forth. You can go to a senior leadership group and think you're going to get a decision, they may tell you to go away and come back when you have more information. So you might not walk out with what you want, but you want to get to a decision. Same thing in that middle lane. You may not go to those middle managers or functional managers until you have a chance to actually have a decision from the board or your steering committee to ask for the resource. But then they may say, well, I need to understand what it is you're asking me to do, so go talk to my team and they'll come back to me when you have more detail. So you may end up talking here and then going back up. This isn't sequential, but it's it give you an idea that you kind of start and stop based on who you're dealing with. And then understanding when the control they have over what it is that you want. So you know who you're talking to. You need to understand what it is you actually want to happen during that conversation. You want to leave here, you want to leave here with something. You're not going to leave here with a sandbox. You're going to leave here with some sort of decision that hopefully takes you to that control. You're not going to leave here necessarily with uh, a policy or the funding to get something done, but you might leave with enough understanding of who to talk to, when to talk to them, and how to talk to them, that you can actually get them to start to move it forward. So it's, it's starting out in each one of these lanes with knowing who you're talking to, knowing what you want to happen, being very clear about that. Write that down if you have to. Write it down. I'm going in to talk to the board and I want a decision made, so let me walk away with a decision. And with the implementers, let me walk away with a timeline of when it might be executed and then just hold them accountable to their timeline. Sort of repetitive, but it's, um, I think, necessary. It helps with the next couple slides. So. so a lot of times, a translation doesn't happen, and we walk into an audience, and we give them a conversation that they just don't understand. All they hear is blah, 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 blah. We need advanced malware protection and next-gen environment. Or what are you talking about? I don't know. Just, you're talking. The board told me to do something, blah, 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 blah. Okay, whatever. I heard board, so I'll give you a resource to go away. Your boss said to put a sandbox tool, blah, 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 blah. I'm busy. But you may be fortunate to get something on the board and you walk away happy. And they gave me something. I'm happy. I can go talk to the middle manager. 
or functional managers. You go there, and yeah, they say go talk to the engineer. You're happy, you're off and running. You get here, and you tell this person to give you a sandbox. They're like, no, I'm busy. I have to upgrade a server or something else to do. Where is this on my task list? My boss told me to do something else. So there's a disconnect here. So even though you've had some success in certain areas, you still don't end up with, with what it is that you want. And I think I'm preaching to the choir here that it is, it's not uncommon unless you own this entire chain of decision making to implementation. So keep in mind that things have different priorities, each and every one. So we kind of beat that horse to death. But you still want your sandbox. So how do you make that happen? Start with Again, who do you want to talk to? Your executive level. Think about the fact that they are innovative, trying to transform the business. The way they may want to hear terms is, what I want to happen is I want to doc document support to invest in next gen tools to combat current threats. But be careful what you're saying. Don't go in saying, I want this thing that will stop this stuff. Because it won't. You can't prevent everything. And you may end up <coughs> just having a policy that says people can't do something, but it will still happen. So be careful in not overly selling what it is you're asking for, where at the same time you're clear enough that you have an expectation that you can come back and say whether or not you've achieved it. So how do you say it? It's like the bad guys are using more sophisticated attacks. They may have heard it in the media. They may have had it happen to them. They may have had a briefing from their attorneys, or maybe you've done a presentation. But they're using more sophisticated attacks than they have in the past. Our control set needs to change. And what you need is for the leader, IT leaders to allocate some resources to get things done. You don't have a very specific ask yet beyond the fact that they need to support you going to get those leaders to allocate those resources. And you want to appeal to their, um, their, their competitive nature. Your peers are already doing this. The more mature, more innovative, more bleeding edge organizations have already made these decisions. So you're kind of lagging behind and you know, you're supposed to be taking us to the next level. What's taking us so long? You may get what you want in that case. You got your check mark. But you, let's assume we've got the support to go to IT leaders. Now you go to IT leaders, you don't want to go in and just say the board said do this, because first off, the board doesn't exactly know what they're asking them to do. But you have the support that they want you to come back and tell them whether or not you've met their expectations. So at the business level, that's who you're talking to. Again, the group that wants to grow, be more innovative, I'm sorry, wants to grow, do less with more, have their processes improved. From them, what you want to happen is you want staff assigned to identify tools that will reduce you know, your threat surface. That's what you want. You're not looking for a decision. You want who is that person I can speak to that can bring me back a set of tools, a timeline, et cetera. Who are those people? That's your check mark. So how do you talk to them? Well, the board expects IT resources will be, a, be assigned. So you've already set an expectation with them. And I need to report back the next quarter, so now there's a sense of urgency there. And please let me know who I can work with. They are they're guiding your, your alignment with their resources now. They know the person that within the timeline you've given them who can probably help you the most. So you're not looking for that, you know, I want to work with John or I want to work with Kim. It's who's the best person to get me these, the list of tools and actually give me something I can take back in the, in the next quarter. When we finally get to those actual resources, your more operational level, what you want to happen is a list of identified tools, or if they already have technologies in place that they can turn on, that they volunteer that information to you. Or somehow you can get that information to help them get the resources to actually do it, the time to actually do it. But how do you talk to them? You want them to know you've worked with their boss. You don't want it to be like a surprise, I'm coming to you, and then they can say, you're going to talk to my boss. Hey, I talked to your boss already. And he said you're the best person to work with. Play with our egos. We love that, right? <laughs> And then get more specific. We're talking about ransomware, or something technical. You know, you've seen it, I've seen it. I'm sure you have some ideas on how to stop it, and I want to hear about that. And then you bring up what it is maybe you want. Is that an option for us? Or what else can we do? What can we do this quarter? Then engage them and let them go ahead and run with it from there. And it's not a one-stop shop. You know, again, you might have to go back to a different level. You might have had a great conversation with that person, impl the implementer, but now they've told you they need resources. The budget's already allocated in one place, but you're going to need money in a different area now that you're asking for a different tool. So you have to go back up the chain a little bit or back into a different lane. And that's not uncommon. So you might have to change the discussion a little bit. You've had a great conversation, and now you come to the point where you want a quote or some sort of schedule that you can take back that's an actual product that can be seen, that can be 
take it from beginning to end. So how do you ask the question? You know, what do you need to implement that suggestion? It sounds great. You know, you're awesome. You want to do, I won't mention product sale. You want to do a product. That sounds great. How, what, what do I need to get for you? Now you have something that you can take back and ask the actual allocators to try to get that resource for the individual that wants to implement this product. Because my assumption at this time is you've had enough conversations in the right way that they want to implement something, but there's barriers to prevent it. Might be money, might be time. But you know what those things are. So when you go back and have a conversation, if it's budget allocation and freeing up their time, that's what you're asking for now. You're not asking for the sandbox. You're not asking for the thing. You're asking specifically for the budget, specifically for the time, and taking that away as your accomplishment of that conversation. And then how you ask for it again is the tool needed to meet the board's expectation. You're taking that same conversation you got earlier back to them again. Remember that expectation from the board. I'm back to ask for money to actually implement that thing. Is there something in your budget to do it? And you can't control that, right? I mean, budget season may be over. Everything may be allocated. It may not happen until the next budget season. But if you know exactly what's needed, and this conversation is more open and specifically about the budget, then you're, you're chasing that for the next 12, 6 months, whatever you're chasing. Making sure that line item ends up on their budget so that this individual can go back and actually do the work. So back to my sandbox. Of course not. I just thought about this last night. But hopefully I can get a sandbox. And at the end of multiple discussions like this, I think we actually will. So frustrations with me, and I think a lot of my team here, um, the reason I asked about management earlier, I don't have a lot of the conversations with the individuals actually doing the implementation. I'll have a team member go to have that conversation. And sending a team member in to talk to someone who's already totally saturated to say, I've got more work for you to do, and they're not their boss, I mean, that's, that's painful. Right? You've got two engineers saying, stop doing what you're doing and do what I want you to do. It's a painful conversation. So what I, want, what I try to do with my team is have conversations about, this is what I need from them. Don't go in and the board said do something. Go in and say, we need a quote. We need a timeline. Get that from that individual so I can go back to their manager and potentially get the actual allocation for it. So there's multiple players in going through this, Potentially, unless you're a smaller operation where you have a chance to be the individual doing it. But it's, it, it can be challenging. And that's sort of what the, this entire presentation is about. But thinking through it, if you know what you want to happen, and actually where you are in these discussions, you can be much more pointed in your conversation and walk away with something that's actually valuable versus just the frustration of hearing, no, I can't, I'm busy. No, it's not a priority for me. Or a board saying, you'd better stop all that stuff and not giving you resources to actually do it. So, as of right now, I don't have my sandbox, but I want to use this. I've been using this methodology a lot more. My uh, CIO and I are planning board discussions this year, so she is, is coaching me quite a bit on making sure the conversations I take to the board don't look like we need advanced threat protection and sandboxes, but actually asking for things in a way that they understand it. So, kind of a quick recap. Just take you through the priorities of each group. Again, the top group wants to transform. They want to grow. They want to be innovative. Sorry, they want to transform, be innovative. The second group, they want to grow. That's typically what they spend the bulk of their time doing, growing the business on behalf of the, the senior leaders. And then the ones that do the work, they, they have to run the business. Help desk, tickets, etc. Take the time to know your audience. If you're talking to someone in that growth space, talk to them in terms that they understand. Define your outcome before you even go in. If I can come out of this outcome with an understanding of uh, what it takes to implement that tool, then I've, I've been successful. Not necessarily with the tool itself. And then ask them in terms that they actually understand. Don't tell the board technology. Don't tell the people that actually run the business. Um, this is going to be a thing that projects us into the upper 20th percentile of businesses in our industry. Questions. I'm always talking. You've been know, talking this whole time. Not one question. <laughs> That's not fair. Yes, sir. How do you see the board responding uh, better to fear or better to innovation? I actually think innovation. So I think the fear, um, it wears off. You know, um, at ransomware right now is big and everyone's talking about it, but at some point in time it'll be a, a, something in the past. 
and it won't be the thing that they fear. If it's part of, actually, I'll, I'll mention that a little bit more. Actually, plan. Thanks for reminding me of that. Um, security is should be an enabler for a business. It can be a strategic advantage of, for your company over another one. So companies that are having a lot of security incidents, it doesn't show on the surface, but like for my organization, research grants. There are organizations that don't necessarily want to give you money if they can't trust you with the data that they that you're charged with protecting. So we've seen some. Um, We've seen some grants not be awarded to us because the language wasn't in there that made the uh, sponsor feel good about it. So turning security in that, into that strategic advantage as opposed to just that burden or barrier that has been viewed as is what I think the board would respond to more. This is a competitive advantage for you because you saw, for me, what happened at Hollywood Presbyterian. You don't want that to be us. You don't want patients coming here saying, oh, can my data be exposed as same as it was out in California? You don't necessarily want that. I think they'll embrace and hold on to that longer than they will the fear of the day, because something else is going to trump that in the media really quick. Yes, sir. How do you determine which information you take to your board? Um, it's knowing your audience. And for me, if, you, if I haven't been there, which I have not to this particular board we're going to, my boss has been there. So my questions for her are more, who are we working with? How do I emotionally get them engaged in what I'm talking about? And based on what, how I get them emotionally involved, that's the, that's the target I have. So you got to have to do some research. You can't show up with your platform saying, you know, understand me. It's got to be, hey, I know you, and I want to talk to you about what it is that, that you want to hear. Yes. What are, the, what are the one or two things that keep you up at night? <laughs> oh, man. I'm a uh, Michigan grad, and I work at Ohio State. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> now that's going to keep me up. <laughs> uh, to be honest, it is, it is those unrealistic expectations that my team somehow is stopping every threat and attack out there. That I'm going to show up and someone's going to say you were asleep at the wheel and you let that thing happen. But that's not the case. Um, figuring out in that long continuum, continuum of where we are and reducing the risk to get better that keeps me up. Like, am I right here, right now, and it's so bad I need to wake somebody else up so that we can talk about this, or can it wait until tomorrow? Uh, the other one is just that everyday event, right? I, I lead a team where if tomorrow we get hit by ransomware and all the systems are down, then we're off and running and have to take care of it. But it, it truly is more of a, is there something we need to be talking about right now and who do I need to be talking to is the thing that sort of keeps me up. So the next day I can go, in, go into the office and actually plan my conversations for that day. And I'm still scared of all the Buckeyes I go and see. So I'm not wearing blue and maize and blue to work. That scares me. Yeah. Um, going to the board is, is kind of a tricky topic because you can go there and, and they have a very dedicated uh, agenda as far as what they're interested in knowing. Um, I guess the, the fear factor with the buzz will get you so far. Um, but they understand numbers, they understand the budget, they know. They want to know that the, that the money that they're investing in the street program is making the biggest impact. What kind of metrics would you recommend that you uh, demonstrate to the board? And how would you uh, line that up with the investment? Great, great question. We actually, um, Cole Weber sitting right there. Yeah, I'm calling you out. Step up here, nothing. Um, it's there are a lot of methodologies out there that, that claim to have a lot of um, quantitative metrics in it. For me, I think it's actually more of a qualitative mapping. So I can't say dollar for dollar that it reduces risk by point. You know, you put in ten dollars, you get reduced by a point. Um, the way we are approaching that is we map incidents to control areas. So it starts with threat scenarios and then we got control areas, controls actually get implemented. So in theory, the incidents that occur in that threat scenario, by investing in that control, you'll see less incidents or the impact of the incidents will be less. Then that rolls up into, I mean, so yesterday uh, a, vendor met, a vendor mentioned that they don't speak management. And <laughs> for me, in management, I saw this picture on this and went, wow, that's just a cool picture. I really like it. I have no idea what it does. 
So for me, with the board, you're going in there with a the metric that says, give them a pretty picture that, not pretty, but here's where we are. This is a long continuum, and you're somewhere in this gradient here. And we're going to move a little bit. Don't have it be a three, you know, red, green, orange, but it's got to be something that shows it's a continuum. We're continuing to mature. So my mapping for the board is more about, it's a, we're in that gray space here because we haven't done anything. We don't really know where we are. We're trending towards a green, safer place. And next time I come back to you, I want to show if we made progress or not. So that progress over that continuum is the metric I'm proposing. We're using, it's much more qualitative because their, their, um, their tolerance for risk will come out of the discussion. I don't want to define their tolerance for risk. I don't want to walk away with, we're a four, so you're happy. I want to walk away with, we're on this scale, way over here is good, we've got some work to get there, here's how I'm asking you to invest to move us, and when I come back to you, I'll, I'll explain whether we've made progress and why, or if we set still, or if we started to fall back because of other factors that have occurred. How we do that, I wish I had a slide to show you, but it's, a, it's more of a heat map. So a risk is, the larger the risk and where it sits on the scale shows the risk in that area. For the board, again, pretty picture. It gets smaller over time, doesn't necessarily move down just one to one. So to answer it in a more succinct way, figuring out where their risk tolerance is, showing them the big bubble. If it gets a little bit smaller, tell them why it's getting smaller versus why it's not getting smaller. And if I need more or, le or less investments in that area. Do, do you use a, um, any kind of a model or any kind of open source like CMMI or anything to measure your maturity? I thought you were going to mention that unicorn, <laughs> that GRC system. Oh, that, GRC? Yeah. Do you have a favorite GRC? Um, Rainbow Dash. Rainbow a, Dash. Yeah. I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a cynic about GRCs. I think. Um, and anyone in here selling one or using one, it's not personal. Um, <laughs> no, short answer to your, your, um, your standardized metric, no. We, we use, we based it off Octave initially, but we, again, we, it has to fit your organization, right? I mean, it just does, and it's, there's no clear answer to that. My goal is to emotionally get them attached to a visual that I'm able to, over time, be, repent, be re consistent. All I want is consistency from it. If the bubble's not moving, then I'm not doing something or the controls are just ineffective. I don't, need, I don't necessarily want to dig into the, the wheels and how they work underneath it with them, just the bubble's still the same size. Why is it the same size? I only have enough resources to work on the, this bubble over here, so this one's not going to get touched. And if they don't like that, well, how can I, how can I get you more to do more? Here's, here's, a, here's a proposal to you to actually do more. So again, I'm cynical on someone selling a, a, a tool or a metric that truly maps into what your organizational culture is. I just don't think that exists. And for security, where a lot of these senior boards have not truly been exposed to it beyond major incidents, right? they get exposed when there's a major incident. Somebody shows up, CEO or CIO, and they go in and say, we had a major incident, it's horrible, we're going to do more to fix it. And now they have an expectation that it never happens again. But there's nothing in there that's kind of <laughs> built into their risk tolerance. It's like you don't have to think about security and our implementations unless we have a big incident. That's not what I'm trying to sell. I want to sell that this is a program over time that will make a material dent in certain areas that we invest in and others will just sit there. If we see the landscape change and need to shift our thinking, the model can show that as well. So we've been customizing it to our organization. I'm happy to share. I mean, it's, again, it's not a silver bullet. We're still developing it, but it's... It's more what I feel will move the organization in, in a embedded or woven sort of cultural understanding of security, not something that just pops up from time to time and do the whack-a-mole and keep moving. So, but, but has anyone else had success with, say, a GRC tool or other metrics? <laughs> Only Jerry. So tell us about it. Tell us how, how can that tool help us from our board discussions, for our board discussions. A lot, a lot of the organization, to me, right, and I, I've been working with GRC. I'm not a vendor. I don't advocate any specific one. Every, every company needs their own. But um, one of the biggest problems I've seen across every company that I've ever been part of in any way, um, they're always talking about how many silos there are and how hard it is to break down the wall of the communication. And each one of those departments have so much data that could be useful to other departments. 
So working in a matrix environment where you've got a collaborative tool, in a sense, you know, if, if you've got it set up right, you can assess once, and there can be multiple units across the organization, whether it be legal, compliance, security, finance, uh, vendor management, they can all get the level of information they need to be able to support a bigger picture of uh, any one vendor, for example. If the vendor does, you know, if it's somebody that you're using, you do a security assessment, you capture that information in there, you've got a, a baseline, kind of to your maturity question, you know, where you baseline it and, and how you progress. And if that vendor makes significant progress towards, let's say, getting a high trust certification, then that's something that could possibly put them above the threshold for accepted, uh, accepted uh, threats. But I mean, I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it. There's, and and uh, I just think that the tool is more of a collaborative tool that, uh, with a lot of detailed risk and legal information that helps make smart decisions. And that, I actually agree with that. My, um, my cynicism is based more on the tool, in my opinion, needs to do sort of what I was talking about in this presentation. It needs to take the operations area's concerns, work be built into their workflows, and consume that in a way that it can go up to their manager's dashboard, and they can interpret that to be, I need more resources to focus on network security controls. And that can go into some sort of view that goes to a higher level that says, the investment in resources to do more in this particular area should reduce the risk. But it seems like that Rosetta Stone of communication within a tool doesn't necessarily, I haven't seen it necessarily exist in a um, easy to implement model. Most, most GRC implementations I've seen have failed miserably because it's not an intuitive uh, topic. And it's so robust that when one department tries to uh, tackle it in, in a silo. Let's say security buys it or compliance buys it. They're only thinking about their objectives. Yep. So unless you can build a committee that represents all those lines of business um, and, and bring in the experts that have you know the experience to build the roadmap, I, I've seen the majority of them fail because of lack of, of, of vision and a strategy. And, and for me, again, my experience only, it has been that sort of blah, 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 when it, I want information to feed into this tool that I can take forward to steering committees to help me make decisions. Just getting that information from the person you're talking to doesn't always seem to work. It's like how many, um, how many vulnerabilities do you have in your server environment? What do you mean vulnerabilities? Uh, OS vulnerabilities, third-party apps, configuration changes, what do you mean? Uh, how many vulnerabilities do you have? Well, we don't have a centralized vulnerability management tool. So how do I figure it out? So now do I have to buy a vulnerability management tool first to help the engineer get me the vulnerability data prior? And I came in there with the intent of getting a GRC system, but I walk away buying a vulnerability management tool. So that, again, those, that miscommunication, or which, which conversation really has to happen first? Is it truly that you do need that vulnerability management tool? and you won't get a GRC for three more years. But recognizing that you're going to have to go ahead and buy this vulnerability management tool, have play the long game, and eventually get your GRC tool down the road. So again, kind of building back into this, this is a presentation I hope to evolve over time, and again, we'll happily share, as it gets more and more tactical in each area. So I think the tactics in these areas need to be a little more well-defined. Like Helen Patton had a great presentation yesterday. And she talked about you know, ways of collaborating and actually doing things versus having conversations about the same problems. So hopefully taking the blah, blah, blah and turning it into a repeatable tool or something is, is my goal. And again, happily share next time around. I'm not here to bash GRCs. They make great rainbows and unicorns. And yes. <laughs> like I said, I don't sell them. I don't represent them. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, everyone.